So it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, who's um, Ms. Izzy Lomax Sawyers. She's a fifth year medical student at um, the Needham School of Medicine, currently studying in Greymouth. And in 2017, she wrote a blog called On Being a Fat Medical Student at the Start of Our Metabolism Module, uh, which went viral. It was a very brave blog. Um, I think it really captured uh, people. She was able to give a view kind of from the inside. And since then, she's been published on uh, Canvas and Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health, interviewed by Kim Hill, contributed to our working group on obesity, guest lectured uh, on a gender class in Canada on weight stigma, and so on. So uh, Izzy has a BA in linguistics from uh, Victoria University before doing medicine. And when she's not busy being opinionated, she enjoys dancing, theater, poetry, and bad medical dramas. So she does have a blog at Raspberry Stethoscope at uh, tumblr.com if, if you want to follow her. So in the spirit of uh, nothing about me without me, uh, we've asked Izzy to come along and give her views from the inside, but also in going through medicine, she's seen a little bit uh, from the outside as well. So Izzy. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Izzy Lomax Sawyer's taku ingoa, he taku to tauira a hau ki te kura whaiora o Ote Poti, ingari i tēnei tau uh, kei māwhera a hau e noho ana. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hi, I'm Izzy. I'm a fifth year medical student at Dunedin School of Medicine, and this year I'm based in Greymouth. I have to tell you a secret. It's a little bit intimidating being here today. I'm only a fifth year student and only a really average one. I can't always hear heart murmurs, reading ECGs feels like reading tea leaves, and I'm not convinced that the JVP isn't a cruel hazing ritual from you guys. <laughs> and this is the college whose members include some of my very favorite teachers. From the consultants at Kew Hospital where I did Gen Med, to the specialists in Dunedin who have taught me throughout my training, and to the doctors whose clinics I now crash at Grey Hospital. You're all experts, and I'll be honest, I'm not. There are experts in weight stigma and health at every size. And from their work, we know that making people feel bad about themselves doesn't make them thinner and doesn't make them healthier. Uh, so at the link up here, I have included a few, um, it goes to a Google Drive folder with a few readings, uh, suggested readings along that vein, um, and a copy of my slides. But I'm a humanities graduate, a writer and a reader, and I believe that alongside evidence from experts, there's value in people's stories from their lived experiences. And so it's in that spirit that I'm here to talk to you today. I'm the oldest of six kids, born to two lawyers, a dad who's always struggled with his weight, and a mum who never has. I like to think I got my mum's compassion, her strong sense of justice, bit of um, challenge in the height department. And I got my dad's eyes, bull in a china shop approach to problem solving, and I got his build. I had a wholesome small town childhood. I represented my district in soccer and netball, did ballet and jazz, got around town on my bright blue bike, and never met a tree I couldn't climb. Mum cooked meals packed with vegetables and didn't allow fizzy drinks in the house but I came from a long line of stocky West Coasters, and for as long as I can remember, I have been chubby or fat. I was in primary school the first time I was teased about my weight. I was 11 the first time I went on a diet, 14 when I experimented with making myself vomit to control my weight, 15 when a boyfriend first made fun of my body. I've been on more diets than I care to count, lost and gained a substantial amount of weight many times, before ending up back where I started. Still fat. Some people find it a wee bit jarring hearing me describe myself that way. And certainly for much of my life, fat was a word that could cut me off at the knees. If I had a dollar for every tear I've shed over that word as a child or as a teenager, I wouldn't have a student loan. So I can't tell you how good it felt when in my, tw in my early 20s, I encountered the work of fat activists who said, the word fat didn't have to mean ugly, lazy, and competent. It was just a neutral way to describe a type of body. 
I came to medical school as a graduate at age 23, and I didn't arrive intending to be an activist, but the seed had already been planted. I couldn't help but notice bias, discrimination, and stigma. And in third year, the week we started our metabolism module, I published a blog post about being a fat medical student and a fat patient. I hope you'll forgive me for quoting myself as I share a couple of excerpts. When you talk to a fat patient about their weight, it is not the first time they have thought about it. It probably isn't even the first time that day. I have been fat all my life to a greater or lesser extent, and I don't believe there's been a day when I have not been aware of it. I dread eating in public and squeezing into the back seat of full cars. I plead claustrophobia and refuse to get into elevators when they're anywhere close to capacity. I always know when I'm the fattest person in the room. I once went to my GP with anxiety so bad it felt like I was dying. In between writing the prescription, the doctor helpfully suggested my mental health might be better if I lost weight, because then I'd feel better about myself. He went on to suggest that otherwise, I might not be alive in 10 years. I was 22, and otherwise in good health. I went to him with acute anxiety, and he told me I would die in 10 years. In writing my blog post, I asked some fat friends what their experiences had been of healthcare. People told me they avoided and delayed going to their doctors, because whatever the presenting complaint, they knew they would be lectured about their weight. They told me doctors had said if they were le less fat, they wouldn't be depressed, stories that closely echoed my own. And they told me about delayed diagnosis of somatic illnesses, of symptoms not investigated when they felt sure that a thinner person's would have been. My heart broke for the person whose family member had been congratulated by a doctor for her unintended and unexplained weight loss, the first symptom of the cancer that killed her. Mine is not the only story of weight stigma, nor is it the worst one. I don't experience the intersection of fat phobia with racism or classism or ableism, and I'm not large enough to find airline travel or clothes shopping impossible. One in every three New Zealanders is obese, and many of them will have their own stories of stigma. And I think we need to remember that for every fat person who has felt hurt by their treatment in healthcare, there's a health practitioner who's caused hurt, a lot of the time unintentionally. I've thought a lot about the GP I saw for my anxiety all those years ago. Perhaps it was unfair of me to write about him, however anonymously. Despite that experience, I have no doubt that he's a good doctor. I think every one of us can relate to the experience of having said something well-intentioned that came out totally wrong and caused harm. And management of complex chronic conditions linked to diet can be emotionally taxing on doctors too, leading at times to feel feelings of helplessness, frustration and burnout. I'd like to share the story of a health practitioner's realisation that her practice was causing harm. She's a nutritionist by training, now an advocate for weight neutral healthcare and a med school colleague of mine. My rock bottom came as I watched a client cry from my office window as she completed her food diary in the car park five minutes before her session. I shut the doors that afternoon to any new bookings. It would be six months before I could step back into practice. I think we need to approach this work of unlearning bias from a place of self-compassion. We're all products of our training and more broadly products of society. And it's a society where weight stigma is the norm. Of course we've perpetuated that stigma within our practice or within our lives in general. I know that I have. How could we not? What matters now is that we keep trying and keep learning. The theme of this session is rising to the challenge. Later, you're going to hear from people who have achieved significant short-term weight loss. I know from my experience that this takes a lot of work, and I can understand that we regard these stories as inspirations, success stories, but I'm in the overwhelming majority of dieters who eventually regained all the weight and more. I am in the overwhelming majority of fat people who, despite best efforts, could not reduce the size of their body to what we consider normal. I guess you could say I'm a failure story. So I'd like to challenge you today to find some hope and inspiration, not in the idea that every fat patient can experience a radical reduction in their body size. Instead, let's find hope in the idea that together, 
we can radically reduce weight stigma in healthcare and in society. The challenge of weight stigma feels overwhelming, but I believe we can rise to it. Here are three actions that each of us could take to personally reduce weight stigma in healthcare. Examine unconscious bias. Take stock of our own biases and blind spots. Reflect on what messages about fat people we might have internalized and how this affects our practice. And one formal way to do this is the implicit association test from Harvard, which allows you to test your attitudes and beliefs about several marginalized groups. Make fat phobia unacceptable. Make it as unacceptable as homophobia or racism. Do this by modeling respectful language, but also taking the time to speak kindly and clearly to colleagues who have used disrespectful language or made disrespectful jokes. Get curious about fat patients. What is their story? How has weight stigma affected them? How do they feel attending healthcare? If it feels right, ask them. It can be powerful to have a practitioner acknowledge that the world is not always kind to larger people. It can be powerful knowing that this doctor is on your team. I have one last story to share with you, and it's a positive one, from a writer who goes by the pen name, Your Fat Friend. I hear my voice crack, strangled, when I tell him that I've tried everything I can since my teen years. In that time, my body did not change. Neither did my health care. He watches me warmly, attentive and sad while I speak. It sounds like your health matters a lot to you, he offers, his eyes meeting mine. And suddenly I burst into tears. All the years of effort, all the machinations to avoid humiliation and erasure, and someone has finally not noticed. Later that day I realised that, despite years of trying, no one has ever told me that I care about my health. And I do. I hope that one day I can be that doctor for somebody. I hope that each of us can. Nga mihi neo ikea koutou katoa. Thank you for listening.